Hello everyone, dear guests. Thanks for joining Module OIC 2020 International Relations Academy. Today, our guest is Ambassador of the State of Palestine, His Excellency, Mr. Nasser Abdul Karim Al Rahim. I'd like to thank His Excellency for joining us today and accepting our invitation. Today, Mr. Ambassador will talk about uh, glimpses from Palestine and perspectives for the peace. And I'd like to thank for His Excellency for uh, his joining. And I am very sure that his presentation will be very informative and uh, very fruitful. After the end of the session, we will have Q&A sessions. And I will read your questions. If you will write them down the below section, uh, comment section. For those who will attend uh, from the Model Wise the International Relations Academy Azerbaijani participants, uh, they will receive their video of this lecture in the YouTube afterwards. This YouTube video is YouTube. We don't as many times more than most of them and the adjacents. Now, Mr. Ambassador, thanks for joining us again, and floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Good evening. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, and uh, thank. I would like to express uh, my gratitude for. Uh, the uh, Eurasia uh, Regional uh, Division of ICYF uh, for hosting me to give this presentation, as I did in the previous years. Uh, this time, under the current circumstances, when Corona, uh, ex extraordinary circumstances, I should say, when uh, the Corona situation is overwhelming the world, so at uh, at least we could connect with each other through uh, through technology. Uh, sure. uh, and through Zoom uh, to talk and uh, uh, talk about the issues that uh, that are of interest to us. Thank you. Of course, uh, I would like now uh, to talk, uh, as uh, as was mentioned, uh, to talk about uh, to give an idea about Palestine because many people hear about Palestine, see Palestine in the news. Uh, most, of the, most of the time, the news are not happy news, unfortunately, and people lose perspective. They always think that Palestine is a land of conflict and uh, is uh, almost uh, in, in a way that takes away everything from, uh, from the people of Palestine and from the history of Palestine and what really Palestine represents. And of course, I would talk about prospects of peace, especially under the current circumstances that uh, it's, it's normal as it's current circumstances, but uh, since after the so-called deal of the century, based on the initiative of Mr. Trump in coordination, uh, uh, the president of the United States in coordination uh, with uh, Mr. Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel. So I will try uh, uh, go through a PowerPoint uh, slideshow, so I hope it would work with me now. Yeah. Uh, we tried it previously, and uh, I am looking forward uh, to share with you, I hope. Yes. Bear with me. I hope you're seeing it. Is it, is it on your uh, is it on the screen? Yes, the floor is yours, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'll give you go through uh, certain areas. Of course, Palestine is associated historically with uh, uh, it's, it's called uh, for uh, for very well known reason the Holy Land. The Holy Land because it embraces the holiest places and of the three monotheistic religions. Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. Palestine's history go almost uh, 5,000 years ago, since more than 5,000 years. And uh, the Palestinians, the today Palestinians, are descendants of the older Palestinians who've been uh, living in Palestine for generations, for thousands of years. And through this picture, you could see Dome of the Rock and part uh, the, uh, where it is positioned and situated on uh, the so-called uh, Al-Haram Sharif, which is a compound, a holy compound, uh, literally it means. 
uh, dome of the rock, the golden dome. Uh, underneath it, there is the rock in, the, in Islam where uh, Prophet Muhammad, uh, from that rock, and the uh, eve of Isra and Mi'raj, uh, ascended to heaven to meet his creator. Uh, and uh, that the rock is underneath this golden dome. I'll probably show you in other pictures. This is another picture of Jerusalem, again, Dome of the Rock. And I have to say, Dome of the Rock is, was built as it is almost 1400 years ago by uh, the Muslim Khalifa Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. And as you see at the, at the back, uh, of, uh, of the Dome of the Rock, there is a church which reflects the multi-confessional uh, 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 reality uh, of the Palestinian society where Muslims, Christians, and Jews used to live together in peace and harmony for, uh, for generations and decades, uh, for centuries, I should say. There's another photo. It is at the entrance of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, as many of you who, who are followers of the uh, Muslim faith, uh, is the first Qibla uh, of Muslims, for Muslims. Uh, Muslims used to pray the first 13 years of Islam towards uh, Jerusalem, towards Al-Qut, uh, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Uh, 13 years after that, it was uh, then relocated to Mecca. So this is the entrance of Masjid al-Aqsa. This is another shot for Masjid al-Aqsa, which is located at the same compound where Dome of the Rock, the golden uh, dome, where uh, the one I showed you previously, they are located in the same compound, the compound that is called Al-Haram al-Sharif, the Holy Sanctuary. Another photo of Masjid al-Aqsa. This is the Holy Sanctuary. I hope that you could see this is it's surrounded here. This is the, where uh, the arrow is, is Masjid Al-Aqsa. And here is Dome of the Rock. Another photos of uh, Dome of the Rock. Now this is the rock under Dome of the Rock. The rock from which uh, Prophet Muhammad ascended in uh, the eve of Isra Al-Mi'raj to meet his creator. This is another photo. This is uh, uh, the walls of all Al-Quds, all Jerusalem, that were built actually for many generations, thousands of years, uh, generation after generation, rebuilt this, uh, these walls. But these walls, the current walls, are built, the last one who built these walls were uh, 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 the, Uthman, the Uthman Khalifa, uh, Sulaiman who built these walls. This is Church of Nativity in Jerusalem. This is the holiest place to followers of Christian faith, uh, which is a few meters away from Dome of the Rock and Masjid Al-Aqsa, very nearby. This is the Wailing Wall, which is uh, uh, where Jews go. It is considered a holy place for the followers of the Jewish faith. Here again, this is a picture expresses the nature of Palestine and the Palestinian people, where followers of different religions and different faiths, and uh, they live in harmony and peace. This is another example of uh, this cohabitation or co-existence, peaceful ex coexistence of the followers of the uh, different faiths. This gentleman's name is Wajih Naseba. He belongs to one of the uh, oldest families in Al-Quds. He is a Muslim. And he, in this picture, he is opening the doors of the Church of Holy Sepulchre, the one that I showed you previously, the holiest places in Christianity. And his family, since 1400 years ago, uh, uh, his, his father, grandfather, great grandfathers go back, going back to 1400 years ago, since, uh, since the introduction of Islam to Palestine and to Al-Quds, this family had the responsibility 
of opening the gates or and the doors of Church of Nativity in agreement and with the support of the followers of different churches, the, uh, the religious leaders, Christian religious leaders in Jerusalem, whether Orthodox, whether Catholic or Protestant, they all agreed to give since many generations ago to let uh, a family, Noseba family, uh, to have their keys to open and close the doors, the gate of Church of uh, Holy Sepulchre. Uh, of course, I, I, I have to give you another photo. This is the Al Ibrahimi Mosque in uh, uh, Al Khalil city, which is called Hebron, where is the tomb of uh, Prophet Ibrahim is located and it is very holy to Muslims. And uh, again, it reflects the, the nature of uh, Palestine, that it's been uh, the land where the most, uh, the three monotheistic religions uh, consider as a very holy uh, place. This is another picture of this mosque. This is within the mosque. This is another photo of the walls of Jerusalem. I'm going through, uh, you know, uh, not uh, through a classical introduction of Palestine. I want you to see the photos to see what Palestine is about, uh, not necessarily through the prism of uh, late night news of uh, uh, TV channels or uh, international networks, news networks. This is another, this is the gate, one of the gates that leads into inside the city of Al Quds. These are the streets of Al Quds. These streets are thousands of years old. They were built by the Palestinians, the forefathers of the Palestinians. And looking at the buildings, the nature of the building, it's reflect the East Mediterranean Arab tradition and uh, the tradition that expands all over Eastern Mediterranean to uh, uh, Syria and Lebanon and Jordan. These are, you, when you look at these, are the alleyways in the old city of Al Quds. It is prob probably, if any of you who've been visiting uh, the old cities in Eastern Mediterranean and Turkey would, uh, would see the similarity, the striking similarity between these alleyways in the old cities. Now, this is uh, a mosaic floor uh, of the palace of called Hisham's palace. It's, uh, it's Hisham was uh, one of the Muslim uh, Khalifas or Muslim kings or sultans, as you like, whichever way would you like to describe him. Uh, uh, this was built approximately 1300 years ago. And it shows you this floor is a very big floor was made with, uh, is, uh, with mosaics, seven million pieces of less than one centimeter uh, size mosaics that was uh, designed and built 1300 years ago. And it was just discovered by, by archeologists a few years back. It is a piece of art and it shows the deep history and the deep culture of, uh, that existed in Palestine for thousands of years. This is another shot of that, uh, of what remained of uh, Hisham Palace, uh, the same floor, mosaic floor. This is another photo. Uh, this is Batir. Uh, it's a village southwest of Jerusalem. It's, uh, UNESCO has declared it as a, a world heritage site. Uh, and it goes back in history 2000 years. These terraced uh, farming uh, has been adopted by the people of this village uh, go, uh, since more than 2000 years, almost 2000 years ago. And that's why UNESCO has, has declared it as a, a human heritage site. Palestine is famous with olives and, uh, and oranges, but mostly olives. And this is part of a picture of the landscape of some part of Palestine were mostly covered with olive trees. 
this is of course olives comes uh, from olives so olive oil this and olive oil and uh, products that uh, that are related uh, that could be extracted of olives that palestine is famous with from olive oil to olive soaps and uh, that sort of stuff uh, these are some of traditional shops inside uh, inside jerusalem selling mother of pearl, another famous uh, uh, crafts, uh, craftsmanship of the Palestinians, a craftsman. Uh, it's very famous in Palestine. Uh, these artifacts are made by mother of pearl. Uh, this is another example of uh, these artifacts. And Palestine is very famous with areas as well, part of the Palestinian culture, uh, uh, embroidery, embroidery making. And uh, uh, this is a, one of the example of this, uh, this culture, embroidery. And it, some European travelers in, um, in the 17th century and the 18th century who traveled through Palestine, Eastern Mediterranean, and then they came to Palestine. They were, they described this in their writings that, uh, in this sector of the Eastern Mediterranean, Mediterranean, where Palestine is positioned, they were startled about, uh, uh, by the, um, the beauty of, uh, of uh, the embroidery of that region and how each village, although they could be far away, just a few kilo kilometers um, from each other, um, how each village or each town or each region within this small piece strip of land which is called Palestine has its own way of uh, making embroideries. I'll give you some examples again. This is another example. Uh, these are pictures that we got from the library of the US Congress and it shows on your left side and I hope it's on your left side in my left side a Palestinian woman from Ramallah, a picture in the 1930s, was taken in uh, 1930, uh, before Israel was established. Uh, the picture on the right, as you could see, a Palestinian girl from Bethlehem, and the picture was taken in 1890. All, when you look at these pictures, and they are a bit col colorful, uh, it shows you the culture and the nature of, uh, of costumes uh, which uh, reflect the culture that existed uh, in the land of Palestine. Uh, in Bethlehem region is well known where the little girl uh, on the right side, well known of wearing uh, something on their head. Uh, it still looks uh, and it makes it uh, uh, elevated a little bit. These other black and white pictures about Bedouin women who was, uh, there are certain parts of Palestine in the south uh, of Jerusalem, there are certain sectors, uh, Bedouin sectors living there. And uh, on the left, there is uh, a photo of uh, a, a Palestinian uh, peasant woman. This is more like today's exa um, examples of uh, Palestinian embroidery and Palestinian costumes. I'm just going through this to give you an, an idea uh, of Palestinians because in many cases, uh, the, our opponents on the other side, uh, Israel and the diehards of, uh, of the right wing, uh, ultra right wing uh, Israeli politicians always would like to claim and, uh, that the Palestinians never existed as a people. There is, uh, and they always, every now and then amuse us with uh, certain statements in which uh, they deny the, the existence of the Palestinian people uh, where, whereby you could, uh, the Palestinian people have been living in this land for thousands of years and they have very rich culture by, uh, by, by all observers' uh, accounts uh, that Palestine, whoever been to Palestine would know that and would see that. This is other parts of Palestinian uh, uh, women uh, costumes. And each region has its own costume and its own, own embroidery. Um, on the left, 
on the right hand, uh, uh, other young ladies with Palestinian costumes. On the left hand, uh, Palestinians, part of their culture is the Dabka, who have ever been to the Eastern Mediterranean and uh, familiar with the Palestinians would know that Dabka is an essential part of Palestinian culture. Uh, Dabka is where usually young men and young uh, women would gather together and usually in happy occasions uh, like weddings and that sort of thing uh, they would form semi-circles and uh, would perform a lively uh, dance called dabka which which is basically stamping uh, jumping in the air and stamping on the floor and requires a lot of stamina and a lot of energy very lively uh, very lively exercise here is another picture of a Dabka, where in this picture I, I, I could, uh, you could see the young men and women uh, jumping in the air in animated the suspension, if you will. This is another picture of, uh, of a Palestinian, represent the Palestinian culture, where men and women dance uh, happily together in, in happy, uh, occasions. This is another one, young ladies performing Dabka. Basically, they are floating in the air. Uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of energy needed in performing Dabka. Another, another picture of Dabka, young men. Here is young Palestinian students, young ladies uh, studying somewhere in Scandinavia, performing Dabka as well wearing a Palestinian, a traditional Palestinian costumes. Palestine as well is famous, the Palestinian culture is famous. Uh, the Palestinian cuisine is famous with uh, many dishes. The one on the right, we see it's called Makloubi. Basically, literally, it means upside down. Uh, it's a Palestinian dish, very popular Palestinian dish which is quite similar to some of the dishes uh, in, in Azerbaijan, but it's cooked in a different way, uh, made of rice, lamb, or chicken, it depends, uh, with uh, vegetables like eggplant and cauliflower, and then it's topped with, uh, with pine seeds uh, and, uh, and almonds. On the, on the left, you could see a typical Palestinian starter from hummus to tabbal to falafel and the, on the top left. And uh, even that, uh, uh, you know, when people uh, start get into the habit of uh, stealing other people's belongings, it could start with the land and uh, deny, uh, deny the, the original people their right to that land, they start to infringe on other aspects of the culture of, the, of those people. And you could see in some places where Israel claims, and some Israelis, not all Israelis, some Israelis claim that hummus is there uh, as if it's uh, an Israeli, uh, uh, Israeli dish or falafel is an Israeli dish. Actually, it is not. It is Eastern Mediterranean dish shared by the Palestinians, Jordanians, Lebanese, and Syrians. Historically, it's been like that. And the bottom left, uh, there is uh, this kunafa. It's very famous in the city of Nablus. And uh, the, probably the most favorite kunafa in all Eastern Mediterranean is the Palestinian kunafa. It's called the Nablusi kunafa in, uh, in accordance with the name of the city from which kunafa was basically originated. Uh, these are Palestinian coins when, uh, when for the creation of Israel. These are original shots of Palestinian coins. You see, one was uh, minted in 1931, the other is 1937, uh, long before Israel was created, one 11 years before, the other is uh, almost 70 years before. And it's written, if you could watch, it's written in Arabic, in English, and in Hebrew. We always, we had no problem historically. There was no problem historically uh, between uh, the followers of 
uh, of the different faiths in Palestine, whether Muslims or Christians or Jews, till that moment. Uh, and in Palestinians as well, we are, in spite of all what we've been going through, the difficulties that you hear, we still, we refuse to, to be crushed. And we are always active. And even on the artistic scene, you, there are many Palestinian movies that were produced and garnered uh, international recognition. And of course, the names here are in English, but the, the producers, the directors, and the actors are all Palestinians. They were basically uh, subtitled in English so it could find an international market and it could be uh, the Palestinian people could be exposed through the Palestinian cinema to the rest of the world. This is Paradise Now, a famous movie. Uh, I think it's almost 20 years old or a little bit less. Garnered many, as you can see in the bottom, uh, many, many awards uh, in international uh, uh, cinema uh, festivals. This is a divine intervention on the left, as well, winner of awards, international awards. The other one, The Time That Remain, a Palestinian movie, Idol, uh, uh, The Wanted 18, Wanted, The Wanted 18 on the right side, which is which is a true story. Uh, the Wanted 18 on the right side uh, is telling a true story that happened in Palestine during the Palestinian First Intifada in 1978 till uh, the end of 2003, beginning of 2004, where Israel considered 18 Palestinian. Now you would laugh and you would think I'm exaggerating, but you could ch check it out and Google it. Uh, when Israel considered 18 cows owned by a Palestinian village uh, represent an immediate uh, and uh, an immediate danger to the security of the state of Israel. I would not go through the details, so I can catch up to tell you uh, to with my presentation. But you could check it out. How could that be? These other examples. Omar is a famous, and it uh, as well another movie that had garnered many. Uh, awards and different uh, movie festivals. It shows you that the Palestinian people, in spite of all what they've been going through, in spite of the occupation, in spite of the apartheid regime that has been imposed on the Palestinians by the occupying power, Israel, especially under the current government headed by uh, Netanyahu, Mr. Netanyahu and his cohorts, which represent the most extreme, the most extreme uh, part of uh, Israeli uh, politics, uh, of the Israeli political uh, spectrum. This is uh, part, some shots from uh, the Wanted 18. Uh, this is Mahmoud Darwish, a famous, well-known, renowned international a poet. He is a poet. He, he, he was. He passed away a few years back. He was internationally recognized. Mahmoud Darwish is uh, even Israelis and even Israelis who are uh, some of the Israeli leaders who are not considered in any way uh, moderate. Uh, some of them are uh, on the right uh, and on the extreme uh, couldn't resist uh, saying that uh, his poems were just uh, um, amazing and uh, very, very touching. This is a writer, Ghassan Kanafani, that was, he's a writer, story writer, Ghassan Kanafani was assassinated by Israel in, uh, uh, in the last century, in the 1970s. Uh, his only crime, he was writing uh, stories about the Palestinian history and the Palestinian um, experience under, under occupation. And he used to write in Palestinian newspapers in exile. And Israel saw by that time the Israeli leadership. So it's fitting for us to go and assassinate and kill a civilian uh, writer. Najil Ali is, is a famous Palestinian a caricature uh, painter, very, very renowned in the region, especially in the Arab world and some parts of Europe as well was assassinated as well in London, in London, in Britain, in, uh, in, the, 19, uh, in the 1980s, as well, 
they considered him somewhat uh, dangerous. They couldn't take his uh, his humor. They thought his humor uh, represented an immediate danger to their security. These are other Palestinian, very well-known and renowned uh, writers and academians on the left, a very famous academian, uh, Brian Jabra, who, who very well recognized he was, of course, he passed away uh, many years back. He was very well uh, recognized and well respected in the region, uh, translating uh, many books to Arabic and from Arabic to other languages. On the right is another poem, uh, uh, poet, sorry, uh, Kamal Nasser. Again, he was assassinated by Israel in the early 1970s. The Palestinians, uh, some people say that the Palestinian, what, they didn't do anything, they didn't, uh, they didn't resist. No, the Palestinian resisted, and the Palestinian society is an open society. And here is a picture of the Palestinian revolt in 1936, uh, 1936 to 1939. It's called the Great Palestinian Revolt. It was against the British who were colonizing Palestine then and who were facilitating for the Zionist movement to establish by that time to help it establish the state of Israel. You could see at this picture, women were fighting uh, next to men in this, in this picture. And it shows you the role of the Palestinian woman that she played along throughout Palestinian history, whether in this conflict or throughout history, the Palestinian woman has been always an intrinsic part of the Palestinian society. And uh, uh, she was always the rock that the Palestinian society drew its, um, its energy and uh, its vigor uh, from the will of the Palestinian woman. These are two leaders, Palestinian leaders, who fought for the cause of Palestine. Uh, one of them was the leader on the left, Abdul Rahim al Hajj Muhammad, who was, uh, who was killed in battle in 1939. He was the leader of the great the, the revolt that I told you about, the great Palestinian revolt from 1936 to 1939. On the right hand is Abdul Qadir Husseini. He was killed in Al-Quds, defending Al-Quds against the Zionist militia then, before the creation of Israel, and uh, he was martyred at the gates of Al-Quds city. Yasser Arafat on the right, Sheikh Husseini on the left. Uh, other examples of Palestinian women, Karima Aboud is on the right. She is the first professional woman photographer in all over the Middle East, all over the Middle East, uh, she took a professional photography in the early 20th century, late 19th century, early 20th century. The other woman is an activist, a Palestinian activist that was was uh, striving with the, with the Palestinian uh, uh, rebels and the Palestinian freedom fighters to help them to help fight against the uh, uh, British rule and against then the um, Zionist militias. Well, I think the part, uh, the most important part now. Uh, we have Palestine. What is how? How did all of this happen? Uh, well, by early, by late 18th century, by 19th century, uh, the Zionist movement was created, and the the sole purpose of the Zionist movement was to turn the Jewish people from followers of uh, faith and followers of a religion like the Christians, like the Muslims, like many other followers, and uh, give them, uh, uh, turn them to a people who are a nation, who have uh, their own national aspiration, and thus they should have their own national state. Uh, the irony is, at the beginning of the introduction of the Zionist movement, it was resisted uh, by most, by the majority of the Jewish diaspora, the Jewish uh, around the world, that they considered it it's, uh, it's, it's a not right movement. And uh, at the beginning of uh, when this Zionist movement envisaged to create uh, a state for the Jewish people, they thought, before thinking about Palestine, they thought, of Argentina and Uganda, Argentina and South America, Uganda and Africa. But then they thought Palestine is the most appropriate place 
because there is a connection with Palestine religiously and, uh, and they could give it an historical and religious uh, context. So it would help their cause better to choose Palestine and thus they chose Palestine. The Zionist movement, is, uh, Jews were never persecuted in Palestine or all over the Muslim world. Jews always lived as an essential part of the Muslim societies, like other parts of those societies. Uh, uh, Jews mostly and anti-Semitism mostly was a product of Europe and Western Europe, where, uh, whether Western Europe or Eastern Europe, uh, where pog pogroms took place against and persecution against Jews was, uh, was the norm. And uh, this had as well having these pogroms happening and this persecution against Jews had helped to propel the cause of Zionism. This is historical Palestine. You could see the green one. This is historical Palestine. The historical Palestine as it was at the beginning at the turn of 20th century, you could see the, the, the numbers, 80% Muslims, 15% Christians and 4% Jews. They were all Palestinians. They were all considered Palestinians. They were all part of one uh, uh, fabric, uh, uh, societal fabric, the Palestinian people. And uh, there were no friction between the followers of uh, these, uh, these sectors of the societies uh, at, the, at the turn of the century of 20th century. Then Mr. Balfour came, Britain, the uh, superpower by that time, it was the empire uh, by that time. Uh, they, Britain, through its uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, the equivalent of a Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Balfour, gave the Zionist movement a promise of, uh, and the so-called Balfour Declaration, where Britain, where the, uh, the British Empire had promised the Zionist movement to give it uh, to help it build the state in the land of Palestine. This is unprecedented in history and never repeated. This example never was repeated in history where a first party, the British, promised a second party, the Zionist movement, who both of them don't live and have no rights in Palestine. The first one promised the second one to give them a state in the land of the third party who are the Palestinians without consulting the Palestinians. So uh, this is all history now. And of course, uh, Britain, as I told you, the British Empire had facilitated the immigration of, uh, of the Jewish people who were persecuted, who, uh, who were dealt uh, with very badly in Europe, especially after World War II, uh, through World War II, Nazism and the Holocaust. So Britain facilitated the mass immigration of uh, European Jews to Palestine without consulting the Palestinians. Now uh, let's go, uh, to go jump quickly through, I think I have another 10, 15 minutes, so I have to finish, uh, try to finish quickly. On the, on the left is Palestine in 1948, the United Nations then decided after a conflict, the Arab revolt, the Palestinian Great Revolt and so on. And many, uh, many conflicts took place since the British took over Palestine. They decided, the United Nations decided to divide Palestine, historical Palestine to two states. Uh, on the, the, white, the white one is a Jewish state to be Israel and the brownish one is a Palestinian state. Of course, giving the Palestinians then represented approximately 70% of the population of the people of, of the people in 1948 at the eve of that, of uh, 1947 at the eve of adopting that resolution. And uh, the number uh, of Jews in Palestine were 30%. That is after being facilitated, the immigration of Jews, European Jews, not Palestinian Jews, not uh, uh, indigenous uh, Palestinian Jews. No, Jews are from Europe, immigrated to Palestine, thus inflating the number of Jews in Palestine at per their percentage, they became 30%. So the Palestinians, Muslims and Christians were about 70 plus percent and the Jews, European Jews were about 30%. The ownership of land by the eve of taking that decision 
was uh, the Palestinians owned 93 percent of the land, while uh, the Jews, all Jews, owned about seven percent of the land. But as you could see in this map, the size of the Jewish state that the United Nations in that uh, in that fateful resolution uh, um, uh, had divided Palestine, giving the Jewish state a larger chunk of Palestine, 56 percent of the land to the to the Jewish state, while giving the Palestinian 44 percent. Uh, Israel was integrated by act of charity. Uh, the Israelis would always, and their uh, apologists, always like to denigrate the Palestinians, the Arabs, the Muslims generally, as as terrorists, as barbarians, and they are they are all uh, peace loving, and they just establish their state uh, without a drop of uh, uh, without any drop of blood or uh, committing any crimes. Actually, Israel was created by uh, by by the power of fire, blood, and steel uh, through acts of terrorism. And here are examples of where uh, Israeli, uh, the precursors to the Israeli army, Zionist militias uh, blowing up. Uh, this is a famous landmark in Al-Quds in East Jerusalem called King David Hotel. It was blown up by, uh, by these uh, terrorist organizations by that time. Uh, another examples of uh, Zionist of uh, Zionist terrorism leading to the creation of Israel that was carried out in different parts of Palestine. And uh, you could see from the posters uh, two of Israeli prime ministers uh, who became the, the one on the bottom, and you could see the arrow on his head is Mr. Ishaq Shamir. He was he was a prime minister of Israel in the early 1990s. Mr. Shamir in the 1940s was a wanted terrorist, even by the allies of the Zionist movement, which was the Great, uh, the great, great Britain, which was the British Empire. The British Empire was looking for this guy as, and was dealing with him as a terrorist, and he was wanted as a terrorist, and they put posters for him as a terrorist. Uh, uh, but then he became the, the, the prime minister of Israel. On the left side, on the top left, uh, Mr. Menahem Begin. Uh, he was as well wanted by the British Empire and was considered a terrorist. And the British Empire was ally, a strong ally, and which is the power that facilitated uh, the uh, establishment uh, of uh, the state of Israel. But that oral history, this is what resulted from 1948. Now, these are all results of 1948. Let's come to today's reality in Palestine. Palestinians and the occupied Palestinian territories are living under extreme conditions. They are living under uh, occupation, direct occupation, and they are living under a regime of apartheid. Apartheid is, uh, is racial segregation based on race. And here is... Uh, some of you probably familiar with these walls, so-called separation walls. Some people call it the apartheid wall, where walls were built almost 10 meters high by Israel, dividing Palestinian cities. Look at the Palestinians, how they are letting, but these are Palestinian workers, how Israel deals with them and let them go through these narrow gates. Uh, this is another example of these walls. The Palestinians trying to go to the other part of the city, trying to climb uh, uh, using a ladder to go to the other side of their own city in Jerusalem. A Palestinian, as I said, living, living under station, living under occupation, and uh, there is no other place on this planet that uh, other people on this planet live under the same conditions the Palestinian live under Israel, the, the, the conditions that the Palestinians live under uh, because of the Israeli occupation. Uh, Israel is well known. It is it's the only country in the world where approximately it indicts 600 Palestinian children and bring them to a military courts. There is no country in the world that would take children and try children in military courts, only in Israel. Almost 600 Palestinian kids, maybe this year were 500, but the general uh, rate is approximately between 500 to 600 Palestinian children. And these children could age, and you won't believe what I'm going to say, from age two years old 
till less than 18 years old, they are represented to Israeli military courts. When, on the other hand, Israeli kids, Israeli Jewish kids, when they misbehave, uh, they, if they have to be taken uh, to a court, they will be taken to a civilian court. But the Palestinian kids would be taken to Israeli military courts. And most of the time, because of the, these kids had thrown a stone maybe at a passing Israeli occupying, uh, occupying army uh, patrol through Palestinian cities. These are examples. These are uh, examples you could see a soldier um, directing his gun against kids who I, I believe not more than uh, probably the eldest one of them is maybe 13 years old. This is the wall which represents the reality. The people, some Palestinian artists, draw the, their reality on the wall that was created by Israel, the separation, uh, the segregation wall. This is Mr. Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel. He represents is heading one of the most extreme government in the Israeli political spectrum, just like I said before. And uh, unfortunately, uh, he found in Mr. Trump uh, a friend and an ally who had represented uh, the so-called deal of the century, which actually it is a sham of the century, where Mr. Trump, instead of supporting international law, where and the supporting international resolutions, the United Nations had, there had issued in the Security Council and in the General Assembly, in uh, approximately 160 resolutions related to the question of Palestine. Mr. Trump, Mr. Netanyahu's friend, has thrown all international law out of the window, all international resolutions out of the window, and he presented this so-called sham of the century. And in his sham, and to explain to you why Palestinians, because some of you would ask why the Palestinians don't accept this, it could be, it could, you know, end uh, this uh, conflict and it, a peace could be achieved. I would tell you point by point. Uh, Mr. Trump, through his uh, deal, or uh, he calls for Israel to take 50% what had remained of the land that Palestine has is supposedly by international law established its own state upon, 50%. Uh, making Jerusalem Al-Quds, which should be based on uh, previous uh, negotiations, uh, giving uh, Jerusalem Al-Quds all to Israel and instead of having it as a capital for two states, the state of Palestine and the state of Israel, Mr. Trump said, no, this has to be Al-Quds or Jerusalem has to be the capital of state of, of Israel. And maybe the Palestinians, he's being generous because it's his land. He has nothing to do with that. This is another example when uh, almost, almost parallel to Balfour declaration where he, he owns nothing and he has nothing in it. He asked the Palestinians to have their own capital on one of the villages that is neighboring Jerusalem, is Jerusalem, where the holy uh, sanctuary is located. It's not in the holy sanctuary, it's outside the city. So of course, this is unacceptable. Uh, uh, Palestine uh, has to uh, renege on its uh, claim for the repatriation of its diaspora, diaspora-based, basically refugees. Palestine has uh, approximately six and a half million refugees scattered around, uh, around that region in, in multiple countries, six and a half million, not to mention the Palestinians who are living under direct occupation of Israel. So Mr. Trump in his, in his deal asked that those Palestinians who are living in camps, uh, refugee camps, they have no right to claim to come back to the state of Palestine, if there is a state of Palestine. Uh, the, the Palestinians have to accept the dividing, the physical and the, the time uh, and physical uh, divide of uh, the Holy Sanctuary, of Al-Haram Sharif, of the area where Masjid Al-Aqsa and uh, and the Dome of the Rock is situated, the, one of the holiest places to Islam, 
Mr. Trump is calling to divide this place, letting this place, let some extreme, not all Israelis, some extreme sectors of the Israeli society, mostly these are uh, colonizers, settlers living illegally in a stolen Palestinian land, to come to uh, and worship within the holy sanctuary, which is basically a Muslim, uh, a Muslim holy ground. So of course the Palestinians would not affect this, uh, would not accept this, and uh, and many many other things. Uh, I of course later I would I would welcome any questions raised by any of you, uh, any challenge raised by any of you. I I would welcome it. Uh, of course time is running out and I have to run fast try to finish this presentations. But I'm willing to ask about any details that. Uh, that you would like to ask about. I'm going to go through this. This is basically, uh, uh, now this is on the left side, uh, internationally now, it is recognized the green areas should be the area where the Palestinian state should be built. On the right side, you could see the green and on the left, on the left is the Gaza Strip, on the, on the right is the West Bank. They are all historical, intrinsic parts of historical Palestine. This is where the international community and the previous American administrations all concur that this should be the territory where the Palestinian state be built, including East Jerusalem as the capital of the state of Palestine. But unfortunately, Mr. Trump plan, he represented it in this you could see he divided that green area, especially the big area, the big chunk on the right side, made it like an archipelago of islands. And uh, the reality is he is uh, calling for establishment of Palestine on this um, uh, uncontiguous uh, land, disconnected uh, like this. I mean, we are making the, the background blue to show you it's as if it's a sea. And these all Palestinian territories are not connected physically, and they, they'll be connected either by underpasses or by bridges controlled by Israel. This is, this is part of Mr. Trump's uh, deal, the so-called deal of the century. Of course, if you bring, and there is, I will show you, here is a map, a simple map, and it says, in the bottom that uh, uh, is uh, that no child would ever be able to draw in a school this map. Uh, it looks like uh, uh, leftovers of, of, um, of some pizza crumbs. Now, uh, what we need to establish to reach uh, uh, to reach a settlement is is implementation of international law. We want to reach peace. We want to reach peace based on international law, based on justice, and and uh, and based on. Ex sorry for this. Uh, seems uh, something uh, wrong here, but uh, I'll come back to it. I'll ex sorry, just one minute. All right. Uh, there are sectors of Israeli society, many sectors who believe in peace and who want to achieve peace. Now I will go very quickly. Uh, Peace could be achieved by establishing a, 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 a Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital to live in peace and harmony with its neighbor Israel. Now I will go further down and I almost finished my presentation, but I think there is something wrong going on here. Uh, I don't know what had happened, but uh, maybe overheating my laptop. Uh, I wanted to talk about something that uh, some of you probably, I don't know, it's, uh, pardon me, I'm, I'm trying to finish, but obviously there is something, I don't know what happened uh, here. Yeah, all right. Uh, obviously, uh, I couldn't continue. But uh, anyway, uh, thank you so much for uh, for having the time to uh, to listen to me, to be patient enough to listen me, to listen to me, uh, 
providing you this presentation. Actually, I was rushing to catch up with the time that I have and to provide you the opportunity to, uh, to provide the opportunity uh, to ask me questions. Actually, I wanted to represent something that I missed in this uh, PowerPoint about, uh, about uh, some of the things, especially our friends and colleagues here in Azerbaijan that you could see in some of the uh, social media, which it, it shows you uh, mendacity uh, overcomes the character of the occupier. They, they are not, their mendacity and lies, it doesn't stop about what's going on in Palestine. It, it spreads to create a mischief between brothers and friends. And, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, I thank you again for your patience. And uh, I thank uh, once again ICYF, uh, Eurasian uh, Regional uh, Center for ICYF for providing me the opportunity to uh, give this representation. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, uh, for very informative, for a very interesting presentation that you made. Uh, we heard a lot of comments from the comment section. They supported Palestine very firmly. There are a lot of comments from Morocco, from different countries all over the Middle East. And they are joining us. They are supporting your country. And even some comments written that uh, they are becoming hungry because of the foods that you showed during the presentation. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for color colorful the presentation. If you don't mind, we could proceed to the questions. Yes, please. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you again. Okay. Uh, there are many people interested in about the situation of the COVID-19 coronavirus in Palestine. Mm -hmm. And some people asking that about the news that occurred that Palestine and Israel started to cooperate about this issue, this coronavirus spread. So what is the situation in the Palestine? How are the government dealing with that? Uh, you know, uh, as you rightly mentioned, the COVID-19 is an extra extraordinary circumstances and need extraordinary uh, measures. Excuse me. Sure. Now, since the beginning, uh, when, since early March, when our government, the Palestinian government, had a wind of there is, actually since end of February, there is uh, a pandemic uh, spreading slowly. The, our government was very fast in taking uh, um, very quick uh, and resolute decisions. Uh, and trying to uh, to minimize the effect of this pandemic. Uh, of course, COVID-19 doesn't differentiate between Christian, Muslim, Palestinian, Israeli, American. It it's it affects all of us as a humans, as a, in a as a, a humanity as whole. And uh, and uh, the the measures we that our government has taken was. Uh, very successful. Uh, of course, because of the nature of uh, intertwining of the occupation, because we deal with occupation and every day, it's like, you know, connected like this because of the occupation. Uh, uh, there has to be some coordination between Palestine and Israel. Most of the measures that were taken, and we have till now, we have 323 cases recognized cases of COVID-19, and we just have one fatality. And the Palestinian people in general give uh, great credit to the Palestinian government for its decisiveness to deal with this challenge from early on, not waiting, not hesitating. Now, uh, of course, there could be technical uh, coordination with some sectors on the Israeli on the Israeli side. But on the other hand, we have Israel, uh, the reality of occupation makes it very hard for us, the Palestinians, to use and to invest in our capabilities, to have the full potential of our capabilities to deal with, because there are so many restrictions that are put by, the Israel, by Israel, the occupying power, on every aspect of the Palestinian life, daily life. Uh, there is, but it is not the, ma uh, the main factor uh, in succeeding 
in containing thus far the effect of the COVID-19 inside the territories, uh, inside the Palestinian territories. We still, uh, we still hopeful, we, our government is still uh, all on daily basis, the prime minister would go out and give, on daily basis, will give a press conference uh, with Minister of Health, with other ministers, uh, talking about the, the measures that are taken to deal with the COVID-19. And we here, we're not talking about the measures only how to fight COVID-19 uh, on the medical aspect as, as a disease, as a virus. Where our government is dealing with the reverberation of this socio-economic reverberation and effect of this disease on the society. So it's trying to sort out all these issues. Israel has been uh, holding our money, our money, Palestinian money, in billions of dollars. Uh, these billions of dollars, if Israel would, if Israel has no right to hold this money. This is a Palestinian money. These are Palestinian taxes. But because of the mechanism that has been adopted after the Oslo Accords, Israel has first control. It comes to it first, and then it's moved to our uh, to our government. Israel is holding this money. Uh, and by holding this money, it makes it more challenging and more difficult for us as Palestinians, as the government, to, to deal uh, with this challenge, immense challenge, which all the humanity are facing, uh, even in a more, in, in more strenuous uh, way and efficient way. But thus far, uh, the feedback from the Palestinian population is thumbs up to the Palestinian government, to the resoluteness and to the decisiveness of the Palestinian government in spite of all the difficulties that Israel presents as an occupying power on a daily basis, we've succeeded thus far to minimize the effect of that pandemic. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, for the answering this question. The second uh, question and the some question related to that is, about the U.S. foreign policy towards Palestine. As you know, elections uh, is happening in the United States this year, and they're interested in what will be uh, the after elections period, after election period for the Palestinian people, for the Palestine. And for example, as you said before, Trump was an ally of the Israel. So are there any chances after the Trump that they will be some peace perspective for the Palestine? Uh, you know what? Uh, as Palestinians, and I think many of your, uh, many of our friends here in this uh, would uh, concur, uh, we have nothing against the Americans. Uh, the American people, they they are friendly, and we are friends, and we have nothing against the American people or the or the United States of America. We have, we have something. We have born with the United States of America government policies in our region, especially. Uh, during the Trump, uh, especially with this administration. Historically, to put it in context, the right context, actually people think that the Palestinians have been in conflict only with Israel and the Zionist movement. Historically, the Palestinian, this and this is small uh, um, people, and people not as small in their size, I mean as small in their number, relatively small in their number. They've been, since the, since the beginning of the 20th century, They've been in conflict. They've been in a struggle against not only Israel and the Zionist movement, they've been against the powers that be, the, the main superpowers on the planet. First, it was the British Empire through Balfour Declaration and the facilitation of the creation of Israel at the expense of the Palestinians. And that is history. Now we accept, we recognize Israel. We want to live in peace with Israel. And then after the British Empire had somewhat its power and its luster withered away, came the United States of America. And the United States of America historically hasn't been very close a friend of the Palestinian people and the Palestinian rights. But nevertheless, in many occasions, all former American administrations recognized that Israel is occupying the Palestinian land, that they recognize international resolutions that were adopted in the United Nations. They, they call for end of occupation and to achieve peace 
based on United Nations resolutions to create based on two state resolution where a state of Palestine and a state of Israel would live in peace next to each other and sharing Jerusalem, East Jerusalem as a capital for, for the state of Palestine and West Jerusalem as a capital for Israel. Uh, Mr. Trump came and threw all this uh, away. Of course, uh, we, we look forward that uh, we would hope, uh, of course, this call is not our call. In the end, it is call of the American people to choose their leaders, uh, rightful leaders, uh, and we wish them best. Uh, but uh, as Palestinians, uh, honestly and frankly, we can't wait the moment we could see the back of the Trump administrations getting out of the White House and some other president comes because he is in cahoots with the most extreme elements in Israeli society. He is not adopting, his administration is not adopting an Israeli, uh, you know, uh, uh, an Israeli stance. No, he is adopting the most extreme stance in Israel, in Israel political spectrum. The most extreme centers of Israeli society, he is adopting their philosophy. And he is trying to impose it through his so-called deal of the century. So as Palestinians, we would hope that uh, the new elections will bring new faces, more acceptable faces, more rational faces, and more the face that uh, you know, appreciates the reality on the ground and appreciates that could not be peace, not only for the Palestinians, for, Is for the Israelis as well, without, without being fair, without giving justice a chance by implementing international. Uh, so we wait for that moment and let's see what happens. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Also, some people interested in the position of the Palestine towards the Nagorno Karabakh conflict. Yes. And, uh, participants from Iran even asking that how we can compare these two conflicts, uh, taking into account that both of them has an occupation, a situ occupation situation by Israel and by Armenia, respectively. So maybe they would like to hear your position about that. that uh, of course, there are similarities and there are differences. There are similarities where uh, you have four resolutions, United Nations resolutions calling for uh, the territorial integrity of the Republic of Azerbaijan, for uh, returning the, the, uh, the Azerbaijani uh, districts back to 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 the motherland to Azerbaijan, and uh, and this these resolutions haven't been implemented yet. Uh, at the same time, and you have of course you have at the same time uh, refugees, uh, Azerbaijani refugees, IDPs, uh, almost approximately one million IDPs scattered in different parts of Azerbaijan. In our uh, uh, and um, uh, compared to the Palestinians, of course, uh, the conflict, the history of our conflict is longer. And uh, there are approximately, as I probably mentioned in my presentation, about 160 resolutions that deal with the question of Palestine. The last one was 2334, uh, which calls upon ending the settlement, which is the settlement, is uh, these are uh, colonies, basically, illegal colonies by uh, considered by international law. Uh, so there are 160 resolutions calling for the end of the occupation of the Palestinian territories. Now, there is one aspect which is different. We have approximately, as I probably put it to you, about six and a half million Palestinian refugees, mostly refugees, and some few IDPs. These six and a half million refugees are scattered in different countries, neighboring countries. And they are living in refugee camps in deplorable under deplorable conditions, uh, unacceptable conditions uh, for any human to live under. And on the, at the same time, we have half of our population is directly living in the occupied territories, in the occupied Palestine, under the control of the Israeli occupation. So here you see there are similarities and differences where, uh, where uh, uh, we need to deal with the issue. We have our own refugees 
uh, scattered around the uh, around Palestine, and we have uh, a main almost half of our population living under direct occupation and direct segregation system. I have it. It should not be underestimated. Apartheid system. It's a racial segregation discrimination system, adding to the uh, uh, reality of occupation. So there are uh, similarities and differences. But in the end, all conflicts has to be sorted out uh, through the implementation of law. Basically, here is international law and United Nations resolutions. Otherwise, if United Nations resolutions keep coming up with the resolutions and issuing resolution one after the uh, after resolution and these resolutions which are based on international law and international humanitarian law if they are not implemented then uh, then we would be living in uh, uh, reality basically it would be as we're living uh, under the law of the jungle where where uh, where anybody could grab anybody's else land at any time uh, of their choosing um, so uh, it is it is incumbent to implement international law based on uh, and international uh, United Nations resolutions based on international. I hope I answered. This. Yes. Thank you very much. And the last question is about. Uh, I think that question raised from because of your powerful presentation. Uh, some participants interested in the visiting Palestine. Yes. For example, one participant even asking that. For a Pakistani passport holders, is it possible to travel pa Palestine? For, for for which passport holders, please? Pakistan. As Pakistan. Pakistan. As uh, unfortunately, you know, the, the thing is that as Palestinians, we welcome anyone. Yes. We would welcome anyone to visit Palestine. The reality is because we are, although we have a government, uh, but we are a state under occupation. There is a state of Palestine which is recognized by the majority of the countries and states on this planet. 140 states recognize the state of Palestine plus the United Nations. And we have embassies worldwide. In Pakistan, we have an embassy as well. Very, very nice embassy. Very, it was provided as well by the Pakistani uh, uh, government. But unfortunately, the, the power, uh, the occupying power controls the borders. And anybody who wants to come into Palestine would have to go through Israeli control of the borders before getting into our sector where our uh, government uh, controls uh, has some, some control over. So the reality for a Pakistani holder, I think for a passport holder, it would be very difficult. I mean, even uh, for Azerbaijanis, I mean, uh, uh, it is not easy as well if an Azerbaijani would like to visit Palestine to come. For us, we say welcome to everyone. We we would request, we would require no visas, uh, and uh, our doors are open. But the thing is, when because they have to go through Israeli checkpoints, whoever wants to visit Palestine, they have to go and get a visa, an Israeli visa to be allowed to get into Palestine. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the Israelis, in some cases, uh, they could be so, such a disingenuous, they would say as they, you know, uh, as if, uh, you know, they don't control anything. They would ask whoever wants to come and visit Palestine, go to the Palestinian embassy and get your visa from the Palestinian embassy. While they know that Palestinian embassy doesn't require a visa, it is the Israeli visa that is required to get into Palestine. Many of our Azerbaijani friends, as well from Azerbaijan, who wanted to visit Palestine, uh, they couldn't visit Palestine. Uh, they couldn't make it to Palestine, or at least uh, they, uh, Israel would make it difficult if it knows, uh, if their authorities know that the purpose of the visit of any particular person is not to Israel, it's basically is to Palestine, they would make it very difficult for that person to visit Palestine. Now it's not always the case, but it's not always the case, but and most of the times it's the case. Yes. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, yes, unfortunately. So Mr. Ambassador, His Excellency, thank you again for answering questions. Thank you again for the joining us and having very beautiful and colorful presentation. I'd like to thank you, His Excellency. And we'd like to end our live stream for now. If you have 
couple of remarks for the participants. Uh, I, I just would like, uh, first of all, to thank you personally and uh, to thank uh, uh, the uh, ICYF and uh, to thank the participants uh, for their patience, uh, to bear with me, uh, to listen to me through this uh, almost uh, an hour and a half. Uh, uh, of course, a discussion about Palestine would take much longer, but it's, of course, uh, it, it would take too much time. Uh, so uh, thank you, thanks a lot uh, for being there, uh, for listening to uh, Palestine's point of view. And uh, hopefully uh, there'll be a day when Palestine, hopefully not too far future, too far away future, that Palestine would regain its independence. And I would be able to welcome you, all of you, including our host, uh, to, uh, to come and visit Palestine and to visit Al-Quds Sharif and visit the, Pal the Palestinian cities, the beautiful Palestinian cities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Inshallah, this day will come very soon. Thank you. Thank Good you, part, Mr. Ambassador. All the best. All the best. Thank you very much. Thank you.